So I'm assuming we're all set there. So with that, I'm going to call the meeting to order. It is 7 o'clock, and this is the regular City Council meeting for Minatrista, April 2nd. First order of business is I'd like to ask that you join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and with that, um, everybody, welcome, and for those of you that are watching later on, uh, welcome as well, and thanks for joining us. So first, uh, we have um, some introductions. Um, I'm Lisa Whalen, I'm the mayor, and to my left are council members, Pam Mortensen, Mike Molitor, Shannon Bruce. We do have an empty seat that we'll be addressing this evening. And then we have our city engineer with WSB is Paul Hornby. Our city clerk is Chris Lindquist. Our director of administration is Cassandra Tabor. And then to my right, we have Mike Baroni, our city administrator, Brian Grimm, finance director, David Abel, community development director, and with uh, Kennedy and Graven, our attorney is Ron Beatty. And on the end, we have our chief of police, Paul Falls. So next is approval of our agenda. We have a number of changes. We're going to add uh, Pam Myers with the Historical Society. Uh, yes, ma Madam Mayor, that was uh, my error on not putting uh, Ms. Myers on the special presentations agenda. So she will go first, and then the SEH Water Tower information will come after that. Thank you. And then I'm going to add, a, make a couple of changes to our business items after consent agenda. We have. Um, Towards the bottom, accept the resignation from Council Member Patricia Thole. We're going to move that up to business item number A. That'll be A. And then after that, we will then uh, fill the vacant council seat. And then we'll move on with the regular um, business items as listed. And then at the end, we'll also talk about council appointments, particularly that would be um, the um, personnel committee. So with that, are there any other changes or additions? Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve with those changes? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, Ms. Bruce made that motion and Ms. Mortensen seconded that. All in favor, signify with aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes. So special presentations. Ms. Meyer, thank you so much for coming out on this lovely evening. <laughs> and also, um, for those of you that may not be aware, um, Ms. Myers also is one of our tour guides, our his historian for our annual bus tour. So thank you for coming, and also, again, thank you for participating in our city bus tour every year. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Nice to be here this evening. Uh, the bus tour has always been fun. I may pass it along to another historian for this year, but we'll see. Okay. We know there'll be a challenge down there with Cody 44, so we're looking forward to the new map for the new bus tour. Yeah, we'll have to make a few adjustments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've come this evening in honor of the 100th graduating class from our high school. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite exciting for us. And I would like to donate on behalf of the Historical Society a collection of the memories of the students who have attended school in our high school in the first hundred years or so that started in grade schools in the 1840s in our area. So I'll donate this to you, but I have a story to tell, of course, a history story. Can I ask which high school? We have several school districts, and I'm not mm -hmm. sure this which one This would be Mount West Tonka High School. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Initially, it was the high school. <laughs> Uh, in 19, well, that's going to be part of my story. <laughs> so Mel Gibbested was a teacher at Mount Wisconka High School from the 1950s until the 1980s. Some of you may remember Mel Gibbested. Uh, he wrote the history of our area, and he said, uh, even before we were a township, school was being taught in log cabin homes. As early as 1858, school was being taught in the log cabin of Mr. Gribble by Miss Celia Sturman. And one of the joys for me in being a newcomer, I didn't come to the community until 1980, so I'm a newbie. <laughs> uh, we have fifth generation uh, students graduating from our high school. 
from the Mount Wisconsin High School. Uh, this first teacher, Ms. Celia Sturman, uh, her most recent, uh, one of our uh, retirees this year, Becky Thorpe, was fourth generation, and her son teaches at Grandview Middle School. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in 1860, Frank Halstead went to Hennepin County, decided we should have a school district. And District 85 was formed, and the first school was built of logs, of course, and it was on Lake Plain. And, uh, in 81, already, it divided into three districts. And John Carmen of Cooks Bay became the superintendent of schools. There were three log houses in this district. In Minnetrista, they were Jackson, Mound City School, and Lee. And if you were on the tour, tour. <laughs> you went to Lee School, you stopped. It's still a family home on 92. Mm -hmm. On 26, 26, yep, yep. Yes, we're all at the other mm -hmm. end there. Yep. Uh, we also had an early teacher who taught in the log cabin school on Dutch Lake, and his name was Cressy, and we have a fifth generation person uh, employed currently at the high school as well that were from the Cressy mm -hmm. line. So we have um, lots of history from our, lots of descendants of our early mm -hmm. residents. So early days, log cabins became frame buildings, one room, two three-person school boards, raising the money for the teachers and the building and the heat and the light. And uh, they decided in 1915 that they wanted to offer high school. Uh, it wasn't a state requirement. State diplomas were for eighth grade. There was a state test that you had to pass in order to get your diploma. Um, but the community decided that they would like to have a high school. So between Minnetrista and Orno, the townships at the time, uh, were interested in doing this. And these little one-room school, school boards voted to consolidate and form a high school, 1915. And the community voted yes. And in Minnetrista, it included Jackson School, Lee School, and Mound School. In Orna, it included Spring Park School and Saga Hill. And they agreed to consolidate, and the school district became the Consolidated High School District number 85. Uh, they found land to build on. They raised the money to build the building. And it became the three-story brick building in downtown Mound on Linwood facing Langdon. What an amazing accomplishment for these little towns to decide that they were going to move forward and provide a local, local opportunity for their students. Uh, children, uh, the superintendent at the moment was also interested in busing. It was a brand new idea, 1917, to have busing. This would be with horses, wagons but brought students from as far south as Victoria, as far north as Medina, as far east as Stubbs Bay, and as far west almost to Delano, came into this consolidated high school. Three story, uh, 12 rooms uh, for students in grades one through 12. Uh, this book is, is co a consolidation of memories from people I interviewed. Uh, it's available, of course, at our historical society and uh, for sale, of course. Uh, but it's also available at your local library. You can uh, get it in a library loan, and they have copies here at our local library as well. So I am pleased to present a copy to the city. Thank you very Thank much. You. Oh. Usually I'll sell you back next month with a test. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Always the teacher. <laughs> Thank you very much, and especially coming out on a night like tonight. So, all right. So next on our agenda is a uh, special presentation by um, Miles Jensen. Thank you for coming. He's with SEH, and he's going to talk about our talk about our water tower issues. <laughs> we'll just call a water tower discussion.
Thank you, Madam Mayor, Mayor, Council, staff. It's good to be here. I haven't been here for a while. You may have noticed that. Well, you can come any time. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. So, so I've, uh, I've, I've come today to talk a little bit about your uh, proposed water tower. If you recall back in early 2015 or so, we got the water improvements projects rolling. And there was really <coughs> three projects, the water treatment plants, the water main connecting the central area and the south, and then the water tower for the, the uh, southwest region. And uh, everything had been moving along nicely, except for perhaps the water tower, which has kind of been a slower process. So we spent some time with staff in the fall uh, lo looking at sites, uh, trying to identify uh, what might work good. And uh, I think I would safely say to, to no avail or limited progress. So what we wanted to do now is go back and look at the, the engineering principles, why the, the storage would be a good idea, and if there's other opportunities. Maybe not a tower, but maybe a, an untreated well. I think one of the versions of a tower is, you can see it, it's up in the air mm -hmm. for everyone to see, whereas a well would be on the ground, and, you know, hidden, but it may not provide the same sort of service that you need. So I think what we wanted to do is, well, I don't think, I mean, I know what we wanted to do is go back and identify all those parameters so we can have a, come back and regroup, if you will, mm -hmm. and have a discussion as to what, uh, what makes sense and get some direction and launch out again. If you have any questions, I guess that's probably as simplistic as I can put it. Okay. Uh, no, we have not. No questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. I, of course, have questions, but Ms. Bruce? I, I have a question. Um, I, I was pleased to see that testing the flow and pressure mm -hmm. is part of this plan. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be done first? Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the very first things we're going to do is uh, put a, a pressure logger <coughs> on one of the far most hydrants in the, in the southwest just to and leave it there for a week or two just to see how the pressures really vary over you know course of a day and a week and things like that. And tie that back into the elevation of the water in the water tower on Kings Point and then the operation of the, uh, the water treatment plant pumps. Put all that into a model and then we can pretty effectively predict what's going to happen in the distribution system moving forward with improvements. I would just think that the outcome of those tests would drive decisions down the road. Mm -hmm. okay. I know staff pointed that out when, when uh, we met last week. Was, that was a, an interest. Mm -hmm. so. And then the flow, the flow part, we'll do that as soon as we go make a nice skating rink out on the, the roads. So how do you, you have to do that with the um, hydrants then? Mm -hmm. Okay, so they have to run or what? Yeah. So you yeah. just so let them flow? So flow. We'll, we'll, we'll open one up, hopefully just one, and then monitor pressure on a couple of others. Okay. And what we're looking for is we're looking for a nice pressure drop. Mm -hmm. The more pressure drop, the easier it is for us to calibrate the model. Okay. So and is this a good time of year to do that, regardless of the ice? I mean, just yeah, in terms yeah. of... A, 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 with a lot of modeling projects, mm -hmm. we try to, to do calibration work around the time people might be doing flushing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because, you know, you're going to kind of stir up the water anyways, or you can. So it's nice to do it at the same time. Okay. Do you have any idea how many different options you might be able to present to us? Well, so, no, I'll, I'll, I'll say no, but here, here's what we wanted to do. We wanted to do, like, if you're familiar with a map that would maybe show elevation, mm -hmm. you know, what we want to do is we want to make a map that would show hydraulic elevation. So in other words, what is, what is the, the water tower, you know, head loss at a certain, so pressure drop, at a certain flow rate. That way, we can take that information and we can look at the distribution system and say, okay, there's, a, there's a, an area this big. 
And then from that, we start to look at land elevation. Because you could put a water tower anywhere, but if the elevation is low, that means the height of the water tower mm -hmm. itself has to be higher. Has to be higher. So ideally, you know, like Apple Valley or Burnsville, where they just have a standpipe on a big giant hill, that those are you know likely the least cost options. So we try to look for a land that's available that might be higher. But, uh, you don't the higher like the higher the elevation, does that also determine the size of the water tower? So the size of the water tower. The diameter mm -hmm. is really the amount of water that you would need for, you know, the system would need for fire flow mm -hmm. and, you know, usage, max day type usage. Okay. The height of the water tower is strictly related to pressure. To pressure for fire flow. Right. Mm -hmm. So in theory, mm -hmm. you could have just a skinny little shaft mm -hmm. and uh, just pump against that. Like the Chicago, the famous Chicago water tower, it's just a skinny little... Oh, tower okay. that pumped against mm -hmm. all the time. So you're going to come back with options in terms of location mm -hmm. and options in terms of, and also tell us what the fire, pr what the pressure is mm -hmm. and what the cost might be associated with each location yep. Yep. and then also alternatives. Yep. Okay. So alternatives... You know, would be, of course, an elevated tank, be a well, and maybe be a ground storage reservoir. Okay. You know, so there you have stored volume of water, but then you have to pump it back out. Right. So what you've done mm -hmm. is you filled it from water that you've already pumped in the air, so you burned up all that energy, and then when you want to put it back into the air, you know, maybe dance it out here, but you, you would be pumping it again. Mm -hmm. So. There's trade-offs for that, so right. more energy cost, but you don't see that you know, it's low to the ground. So with a water tower in the Southwest District, that tower would be filled with treated water? Yes. And then, but with an additional well, that well would not be treated? That's correct. Okay, so, would, so when you come back, maybe you can explain all that, but I'm assuming then that would basically be used for fire protection? Is that... If, and this was just something that, that we threw out the other day, but if you put a well in first, the theory would be that that be just for you know, fire protection. Right. Because as soon as you turn it on, now you're going to essentially bring that untreated water into the system. And right. You really want to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. All right. I had one other thing. Um, we all got a email from Mr. Notch yep. with some concerns about the cost for this study and I thought it would we could just give you an opportunity to answer the question that he posed in his email to council members and I think we all got that email uh -huh. um, and in his email he says that the city is paying SEH $224 per hour for the services of a project manager and I'm just quoting his email mm -hmm. This equates to an annual salary of a full $465,920 based on a 2,080 working hours in a year. So there's some concerns about the cost. Can you address that? Please? Yeah. So that's that's uh, you know the, the the hourly rate of our company, and, and that's for me. But you know there's overhead and all kinds of things, and it would be kind of nice, frankly, if it wasn't overhead. It's a, it's, a, it's a typical salary, and then the rest of it just goes into the company operation. And, and, and that hourly rate, by the way, is there's not many hours there for, for me. The, the, the worker bees are much less, if you put it that way. <laughs> so we're not hiring Miles for a year. <laughs> That's right. Or, or well, no, I, I, I think I understand. When, when people have concerns about the rates we're paying for things, I think we ought to address them. I understand that, but um, it's not the same thing as buying their services for a project for a little under $11,000. You can prorate it to a year if you'd like. That's interesting, but it's not really relevant to 
what we're going to do here. So we're not employing him at a year. We couldn't afford miles for a year. Oh, I, I know. <laughs> couldn't afford miles for half even a year. without overhead. Half a year. <laughs> yeah. so. All right. Well, and SEH is still under a contract. Correct. So it's still under that water contract yeah, yeah. that we signed a couple of years yeah. ago. And this is an additional scope, but obviously once, yeah. if we ever in, our, in all our lifetimes here find a water tower site. <laughs> not trying, but, but, um, no, Brian, think positive. <laughs> I know, We're I know. going to. <laughs> no, we have tried, no, we, we've, mm -hmm. we've tried uh, mm -hmm. very hard, but obviously uh, then we would move on to the design phase, which we've already got that contract in place right. with uh, SEH. Yeah. Right. So. Okay. I do have a question as well. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and this might be too early to ask the question, but um, you know, part of what I think I saw in here was looking at just not only a water tower, as you mentioned, or some storage facility, let's not just call it a tower, and well, <clears throat> but also a site for a potential third treatment plant at some point down the road. Um, will you be considering that location of that site to necessarily have to be with the storage water facility, or would you consider possibly splitting those two apart? Well, they certainly can be split apart. I'm, I'm not opposed to that. That's, okay. that, I think that comes more to what's available to the city right. and all that sort of stuff, but you know. They can be split, okay. I just wanna make sure that we're considering that as we're looking at this, that, that doesn't, they don't have to be wed together. No, okay, no, great. No, yeah. Okay. So I, uh, one yep. other question, sure. where the money to pay for this is coming out of the general fund? No, water, mm -mm. The water, the water fund. fund. And yeah. we've budgeted dollars for the past couple of years. We've carried it forward, obviously, to, I think even this year we have, don't almost want to quote, because then someone will say, hey, that's how much we should pay. But we have, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars budgeted for this year to hopefully find and purchase uh, a site for okay. the water tower. Or, from the water or, fund. Or, right, yeah, yeah, from yeah. the water fund, correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. That's pretty, pretty normal mm -hmm. process. Okay. Um, staff, what are you looking for? Do you need a resolution to go ahead with the contract that not to exceed? Is that? Um, well, we have the, yeah, I, I, I did prepare a resolution for you tonight, Mayor, Council, but uh, with your approval, um, we'll, yeah, I'm just trying to find my. I was going to say, what? Yeah. Oh, I do have it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, it's on page four, as Brian pointed out to me. So, you know, we're um, asking the council to approve this in a not to exceed amount of 10,900. 950. 10, yeah. 10,950. Thank you. Okay. So, any other questions? And this will be back. Did I read May? Yeah, the, the, uh, the, the, the hope here is, is that we would be able to come back to you May 7th. And uh, share the information. information. Yeah, just okay. like keep it right. Important. We want to keep it moving along. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, is there a motion for the resolution approving a proposal for a siting analysis by SEH Engineering for a potential water tower location in the southwest area of Minnetrista in the amount not to exceed ten thousand nine hundred fifty dollars? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Is there any further discussion or questions? All those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 4-0. Thank you, and we'll look you. forward to your analysis. You. All right. <coughs> so um, we don't have anybody under persons to be heard this evening, so we'll move on to our consent agenda items. They consist of our regular meeting minutes from March 19th, approving our claims. Um, C is approve advising the dis disposition of tax forfeit land outlot A Maple Leaf Estates and D is a resolution to approve the advising of the dis disposition of tax forfeit land outlot B and Maple Leaf Estates and E is approve our first amendment to subdivision agreement of Jessen Acres. You, anybody need to pull any of those? I'd like to pull the minutes. I okay. may. Okay. So that would then leave us with B, C, D, and E. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Motion has been made by Ms. Mortensen and seconded by Mr. Molitor for consent agenda items B, C, D, and E. Any further questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. Ms. Bruce? 
Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, Council, on page 12, uh, where it talks about the Med Council Interceptor Project, at the very end of that item in the motion, um, and this is probably just for Ms. Lindquist, is the statement should say, with a, instead of a total estimated cost of 40000 it should say uh, not to exceed. That was the reason for putting the number in the resolution. Okay. I wasn't at that meeting, but is that your recollection? I believe that was an estimated cost for that work. It, there was no mention of a not to exceed in that statement. There are, we're just advising what the potential costs were, we're estimating for the meetings and the costs that were already expended. But the resolution was passed to allow them to spend $40,000. That was the fiscal that, impact. Correct. That was added. Yes, that was added. So that was my that, that understanding. Be, and that has to be added to the resolution, the costs that were incurred and that are estimated for, the, for that, for that work. So not to exceed. Yeah. So do you want me to mm -hmm. change it to not to exceed, or do you want me to leave it as total estimated cost? I would like to say not to exceed. And if it, if it exceeds well, it's not that, a matter it of, would come it's back. It's a matter of what was actually said. That, that's the, that's the question. The tape. Can okay. we do that? Yeah. Okay. Council memo had estimated numbers. That is what the council memo. But it could be that at the meeting they said yes. I don't recall that. Not to exceed. Let's just check on that. Just make sure because. And I'll just bring them back for the next council meeting for approval. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So that concludes our consent agenda items. So we'll move on to our business items. So we have no public hearing this evening. So we'll move on to our business items. We have. First item um, on our agenda then will be um, accepting the resignation from Council Member Patricia Thole. Um, I think by um, state statute, Ms. Thole has to deliver a letter uh, addressed to the Mayor and Council um, regarding her resignation and that is was in your packet and then we need to accept that and then it is official and then that vacates the seat and then we can fill that seat. So is there... A motion to accept the letter of resignation by Ms. Thole. So moved. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Okay. All those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed, motion <coughs> passes 4-0. I wasn't here for, for the last meeting, unfortunately, and I just I do want to just say very briefly, um, Ms. Thole, um, Patricia Thole, council member, did uh, serve the city very well. She was very diligent in her in her work here, she was very thorough. She was always very um, forthright, and um, I really appreciated her her teamwork and her efforts here. And I think with her help, we we have been able to move the city forward in a very positive manner. And I just want to say thank you to Ms. Thole for all that she has done for our community. And she will be a hard act to follow, and uh, she will be missed. So with that, then. Um, we did do some interviews at our work session. We had three applicants. We had four applicants and one withdrew. So we ended up with three very wonderful applicants. I want to say again, thank you all for applying. Um, I was surprised that we had four and now three. I, I didn't expect to get so many, and I know that sounds like <laughs> not a lot, but it is a lot. Um, also very excited to see that we have newcomers as well interested in city council. So um, thank you all again for applying. So with that, we can start our discussion in terms of we have the three are um, uh, John Chumperlin and Kathleen. I don't have the list in front of me now. Hold on. Um, Kathleen Refkin and Scott Pekarik. So. <laughs> Any, anybody want to start? Well, I'll go ahead and start. Um, first of all, I love the fact that we have people, fact, that, uh, <coughs> uh, especially with younger families and in the development, uh, newer development uh, areas within our city. Um, so thank you for showing your interest. Um, and just looking at what is required of the city council, um, I just want to say my thoughts about John Chamberlain. 
Um, I have had the opportunity to work with John uh, as he has been on the Planning Commission for two years now, a little over two years. And I have to say that uh, he has always come to meetings incredibly well read um, and well prepared for every issue that he is addressing at that meeting. Uh, extremely organized and I think he has totally grasped the process of what it takes to be involved in the city um, and what it would take to be uh, on the city council. So I think with his experience in the planning commission, he's very well uh, updated, obviously, with the things that we are currently addressing, uh, the roads that we are looking at, um, different all elements of the city. Um, so I think that's just a real plus for John. And uh, I think his two and a half years has uh, gotten him well prepared for this position. Mike, do you care to weigh in? Um, why don't you go ahead with Shannon first? Ms. Bruce? Sure. Um, I, I agree. I think uh, with, with a lot of the things that Pam said about John, I think he's, he's served well on the Planning Commission. I think he has a lot of experience. He's lived here for 31 years. What, what I see in, and I'm so happy to see some other people that live in different parts of Minnetrista that are interested in being on city council, because I, I look at the council that's here and we are heavily weighted coming from rural areas that, um, and I know Mr. Molitor lives on the lake, but we don't have any representation from the southern part of Minnetrista, from the young families that have kids that are going to schools and that are gonna live next to the commercial development and deal with all of those issues down there. So I'm leaning towards that being more important and it's no reflection on Mr. Schumperlin's longevity and his service to Minnetrista. I, I think we need representation from that part of the city on the council. And um, of the two candidates, I like the experience of the business experience um, of Mr. Pekarik and um, the fact that he's been on HOA boards, that he's, he's had experience with builders and um, all of that. So, and I, I don't see the lack of um, longevity in the community as a negative at all. I think it's, it would be great to have a fresh face that doesn't have any access to grind that is here just to build a safe, vibrant community for their family is what he said. And that, that impressed me. So I think that's where my thoughts are. Okay. Mr. Malatron. I think the thing I'll start out with <clears throat> pointing out is that as just a reminder, this will cover the remainder of this year, and fortunately, the citizens then get to decide. So our decisions are uh, merely temporary. Uh, not to downplay that, but also to say that um, you know, I'm actually very grateful that our decision is only temporary. So, um, so if we pick someone tonight that the citizens uh, decide, because this ter this position will obviously be. You know, up for election in November. Uh, so if the citizens aren't happy with our choice, uh, they don't have to live with it for too long. So um, I'm, I'm quite pleased with that. Uh, to that, I would say, uh, I, to Pam's comments, I've worked with Mr. Chipperlin as well uh, on the Planning Commission, and then um, he's obviously a regular attendee at the meetings here, um, well-versed in, in the issues here. Um, I think for what we need in the interim. Uh, I like the fact to get the experience of that. Um, when we get to the general election, um, there'll be an opportunity for two seats that we can, you know, if there's someone that wants to start fresh at that point, uh, it's gonna be the voter's choice. But I think in the interim, uh, I've done a lot of interim work myself professionally, and uh, I know that the experience is always looked upon highly for that, so. Okay. Um. Well, again, I, I can't reiterate enough um, how I appreciate everybody applying and your interest in, in our city. Um, I think 
uh, things that every one of you said really were spot on. Um, you said you wanted to be involved because you wanted to gr create a great community, although I would differ slightly with you saying we already have a great community, but we can always make it better. Um, and just, uh, yeah, just I think um, any one of them would be good. I think right now what our city needs is, I would tend to agree with um, Council Members Mortensen and, um, and Molitor, what our city right now needs, being that we're on the cusp of approving our comprehensive plan and we're approving um, road infrastructure uh, plans and, and also the water tower, these are issues that I know Mr. Chumperlin is very well aware of and is very um, knowledgeable on. In fact, I know you served on the um, Planning Commission as well as on the um, Steering Committee for those. And I think, um, again, you put it very eloquently, Mr. Molitor, how this is an interim position. Um, and if the voters don't like what we did, maybe in the fall they'll make a different decision. But um, again, we need somebody right now that knows the issues, that can hit the ground running, and that that really will do their homework well and not that you wouldn't. But the other thing I want to uh, make clear is um, I don't think that Mr. Um, Thumberland, uh, Trumperlin has any kind of ax to grind. If he did, I, I don't think I would be making this decision. You folks don't have any ax to grind either. So um, I don't think that's the issue. Longevity, it may play a small part, but again, not really. Um, my, my concern is being able to hit the ground running and knowing the issues and being, um, the other thing I want to say is I agree with um, Ms. Uh, Bruce, it's really great to see younger people and people from other areas of the city, I absolutely agree with that um, and hope to see you folks back here soon, um, but you know as we sit up here, I don't look at it and I'm going to speak for myself, I don't look at it in terms of I live out in the rural area, and so therefore I represent the rural district. I meet and talk to a lot of people in our community, a lot of people. And I feel I have the pulse of the community. And we, we as a five council um, member, we represent our entire community. And I know uh, we will continue to do that regardless of who is here we will look at what is in the best interest of our entire community and not representing a small fragment of it. So with that, I, I would say um, it's a hard decision, but um, with everything in play, I would still say Mr. Chumplin would be my choice. So with that, is there a motion to appoint Mr. Chumperlin as the, what would be the correct wording on that? To fill the vacant, to fill the yes. vacant seat. Yes, as a, uh, Madam Mayor, Council, it would be to fill the vacancy on the City Council. Okay. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. Further questions or comments? Yes, I, sure. I think we have to keep in mind that this, I've heard it said that this is a temporary appointment. Whoever we appoint today is the incumbent in November, and incumbents carry a distinct advantage with them, sure. and they're very likely to be reelected. So this isn't just a temporary appointment. This carries a lot more weight than that. Sure. Um, Ms. Lindquist, could you tell me, are they listed as an incumbent, or are they listed as um, an appointed? I believe they're listed as an appointed. I don't think they are listed as an incumbent. An incumbent. Okay. That's Mr. Beatty, do you know? I'm no, I, Madam Mayor, I don't know. Okay. I mean, I can check on that and get okay. back to you, but yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Mm -hmm. Okay. But they're not an incumbent. All right. Okay. Good question, though. Um, good comment. Thank you. So with that, then all those in f any other questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Okay. Motion passes 3-1 with Bruce dissenting. So thank you very much. Hopefully we'll see you again. Um, with that, we'll move on to um, item number, this would be number C now, approve our local 49 Public Works labor agreement. That would be Ms. Tabor? Yes. <coughs> we are members of the council. Um, 
I'm presenting this on behalf of our personnel committee, and I do just want to acknowledge um, I seem to be playing a little fast and loose with our dates there in the first two paragraphs, so I apologize. The existing public works um, contract expired on December 31st of 2017, not the 18th, not 14, it seemed to be a little out of touch there as I was typing that, so I apologize for that. Um, so I will take a moment and walk you through the changes that are being proposed. Um, the first one begins with the request for a three-year contract. That is something that we were in agreement with our labor union, a three-year contract. That would take us from January 1st of 2018 this year to December 31st of 2020. Um, Article 9, there's a, a little bit of cleaning that happened with this contract. So originally in our last contract, um, the, the current contract we're functioning off of, there was an end page that just had additional items. So we want to make sure that we found homes for those. So some of these aren't, addition, aren't actually additional items or changes, it's just moving. So under Article 9.5, this language was moved from additional items, but there was no changes to the language itself. <coughs> um, so employees shall attend trainings as directed and they're paid at time and a half regular pay. Article 9.6, that language as well was moved directly from additional items. There was not any changes. Employees assigned by the employer to the position of temporary lead will be paid an additional $2 an hour over the employee's current rate. And then under 9.7, this was a move and then a clarification. So language move, was moved from additional items and then we clarified it to state that seasonal and temporary employees will be scheduled according to the Minnesota State Statute. Um, depending on age, depending on whether or not someone is a student affects their number of hours and days that they can serve as a seasonal person consecutively and throughout the year. So that Minnesota state statute just allows us to clarify that to make sure that we're protecting the city. Did you want to add something else to that? Um, yeah, the, the, you can go beyond the state if, if, if that is your prerogative, but we decided to um, use the state language. I thought it was a lot tighter and mm -hmm. cleaner. Uh, it's actually less time for seasonal employees. Um, it just means that we have to be just a tad bit more creative as we do our hiring for that for those positions. But we wanted to kind of line up with state law on this and not be an outlier for basically no reason. So. And then managing that allows us to um, not let our seasonal employees run over into pair benefits without us being aware of what's happening. So. But right now with seasonal employees, we don't play, we don't pay PERA benefits. Mm -hmm. So it's a cost saving measure too as we watch that for the city. Um, Article 12 callback. So under Article 12, an employee who's called in for work other than their normal schedule would be compensated for a minimum of three hours. <coughs> that was a change from two hours. Um, and that's at time and a half as well because they're being called in outside of that normal 40 hours. Insurance, um, if you recall, we had put out to all of our unions a request for an MOU to accept the tiered rates that we had approved for this year. Um, the Local 49 union did agree to that MOU before we even began negotiations. So for 2018, the employer will contribute monies based on the following tiers, um, employee 900, employee plus, whether it's child or spouse is 1200, and then our family is 1500. That's a change from the flat 1100 that we did in the previous year. Holidays under Article 21.1, employees shall receive 10 full days and two half day paid holidays. Previously, that was listed as 11 full day holidays. And then again, fast and loose, I apologize. Article 22 is wages. So article under Article 22.1, uh, public works employees will receive a two and a half percent wage increase in 2018. Again, we talked about this with um, our last labor agreement. That was something that we made very clear that that's what was budgeted for. Um, and that's what we were able to do as a city. So that's a 2.5 percent wage increase in 2018 over 2017. A 3.25 wage increase in 2019 over 2018 rates. And a 3 percent wage increase in 2020 over 2019. I have a question. I asked Mr. Baroni this on the phone today, and our public works um, union contract um, stated that 
their wage increase over three years was 8.25. This is 8.75. It's higher than the public safety contract. Yeah, and as yeah. I mentioned to uh, Mayor and Council, as I mentioned to Councilmember Bruce on the phone, you know, when we look at contracts, you know, I, ideally we could, it would be awesome if we could pay everybody the same percent in these bargaining units as, as we do with everybody else. Um, but a lot of this, a majority of this is based on market. So as we look at comparable jobs in neighboring cities that are out here in the West Metro, we're looking at their wages and trying to make sure we're not maybe leader of the pack, but we don't want to be last. So we just want to be competitive. And these wages allowed us to be competitive for this particular group of employees. So um, the other thing to, to keep in mind is, um, and believe me, the, the unions remind us of this, is you know, as we look back historically at what rate increases have been, you know, depending on when contracts expired and then were uh, uh, renegotiated or negotiated for approval for the following years, um, they used to stagger this particular time. All contracts were up at the same time. That was kind of done intentionally, but and I can get into more detail if, if needed. But the the whole idea here is that we look at not only kind of where they've been, but where they're going. So. You know, these guys, I don't know if it's the case, but in general, if, if they're getting a little higher one, that means that we probably gave them something a little lower in the past, and this is a bit of a catch-up. Again, we're just targeting the market. So we we could have been below the market before, and now we're back at the market with these increases. So it's 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 not like we're, we're trying to give one bargaining unit a half percent more on purpose because we don't like them or do like, you know has nothing to do with it. It has to do with looking at comparable jobs in these job categories to make sure they're we're competitive in the marketplace. So. And I want to say, was it two years ago that you assessed market <coughs> police and we did some adjustments? Correct. So I think, too, we're coming off an adjustment for uh, police officers that didn't happen necessarily and wasn't warranted at that time for our public works. And so our police officers, we were just a little bit easier over to your time span to have maintained you know, that market norm mm -hmm. where with public works we had to take a little bit different look at that just because it had been a little while since we looked to balance things out okay well and that makes sense and yeah. I if, yeah. if I had known that I would mm -hmm. yeah. but it's a, it's a very good question yeah because very good you know, well, what's the difference you know, we tried to do the same <laughs> yeah. 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 no I think that like was I said a, that in an ideal question. world it'd be nice to just give everybody the same one every year but yeah, yeah. Be that as it may, labor negotiations aren't quite that simple. So, yeah. Um, and then if we look at duration, like I said, a, a correction there, but our agreement would begin effective January 1st, 2018, and remain in full force and effective into December 31st of 2020. Um, I did note here again that those additional items had been moved. Um, and then we did create an Appendix C, and the reason that this was done was when we looked at those additional items, we had a lot of things that fell into the same category but didn't have a home, so we were able to create then a category for that. So items in the appendix are formally located under additional items and have been categorized in the new Appendix C. So this existed before. Employers will provide a polo-style shirt for designated events formally noted as school and city events. So um, as many of you see at Trista Day, who, depending on the weather, <laughs> our, our guys are wearing those in the tent as they're flipping hot dogs too. So um, footwear, employees will be provided $200 per contract year, a $600 maximum over the duration of the contact contract. This is an increase over the 150 provided in the previous contract. As we talked about with our um, police officers, the cost of footwear is increasing. So we're wanting to make sure that they have suitable and safe footwear. If an employee ends his or her contract prior to the end of the contract, he or she must reimburse a prorated amount of clothing, footwear, and our prescription safety glass expenses. So they are able to spend this maximum for the three-year contract within the first month of the new contract if they would like, but again, it's prorated then if they were to leave. Because in some of these situations, um, $200 won't get them a new pair of boots. So they're having to kind of dip in, depending on where they are in their boot cycle. Um, and then the prescription safety glasses. As allotted in previous contractors, employers will provide $250 a year, which is $750 maximum over the duration of this contract for prescription safety glasses. And I believe those were the changes. So 
Any other questions? Anything else I can clarify? I have a question. On page 59 of the redlined part of the agreement, there is a paragraph that's talking about leave benefits and how those are going to be discussed later because we've already set the budget for 2018 and all of that, and I, I get that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm fine with discussing those leave benefits later. The language in this paragraph, though, it sounds like we're agreeing to make changes to those leave benefits prematurely. And if, and, and the, the part that bothers me is where it says that we have a goal to update them because that implies that we'll, that we're going to change them and we may not. And we may change them me, to, to the better please, though. Please let me finish. Update means change and the only change that ever happens is they go up. So I would like to make that clear and the, the sentence that um, starts with the employer would like to have updated leave. I would like to change that to say the employer will evaluate benefits for all employees available because that doesn't imply that we're going to change something or increase something in the future. It just means we're going to talk about it. We'll discuss it. And yeah. that I would also change the last sentence and strike um, the words after the word topic through implemented and essentially taking out with the goal of updated leave benefits implemented because that implies we're raising them. Uh, Mayor and, and well Council, I'll just jump in. So we had this conversation earlier today, Council Member Bruce and, and I. Um, and as I explained to her that, and I'll just tell everybody in the room tonight, we, for all leave benefits, for all bargaining unit contracts, we put in this language that Essentially, because, and this is the reason I alluded to earlier, one of the reasons that um, we tried to strive in our last contract cycle to have all of our contracts expire in the same year, last year, is essentially for this reason. We've had, over the time I've been here, and I've been here since 2009, so I've negotiated a number of contracts uh, on behalf of the city for all our unions, all during that time. Uh, without fail, all the bargaining unions at different times or another have, have been poking at leave benefits saying, could we get more of this and more of that? The whole goal of having the last round of the contracts expire all at once was to be able to address the leave benefits. So um, my personal opinion is I think we're behind on leave benefits, but we are going to do the research to find that out. But all three bargaining units, units totally understand that anything could happen. They could go up, they could do go down, I doubt it, but or they could stay the same. So there's no misunderstanding between us and the three bargaining units. And when I wrote this language, I believe I wrote it, because mm -hmm. um, we kind of tag team this, mm -hmm. um, the goal was to say we're going to take a look and update our leave benefits. That doesn't mean they're going to go up. They've, they're under the full understanding that they may not go up. It could be dependent upon what type of, of leave benefit it is. There's a number, there's comp time, there's sick leave, there's vacation leave, there's holiday pay, there's all sorts of things, holidays. So there's many factors for quote leave benefits. So I have no trouble with updated. I don't think wordsmithing that to something different is going to make any difference at all. Basically because before we go back to any of our bargaining units and negotiate that, we're going to be in front of this council and asking for your approval on whatever it might be that we take back to our uh, union representation. I, so. I just this this sets an expectation that they will be increasing, and I don't think that's wise to do. If, like you said, they may stay the same. If they're going to be updated, that implies they're going to change, and they never go down. Well, I don't think that though. we, yeah, that there, there could be trade-offs. There could be PTO where there right. could be, so, could be so trade-offs. Hold on, just that. a minute. Um, I'm going to say a few words first. So let me finish. Um, so we talked about this, and one of the things that you need to also look at here is if we change this language, then it has to go back to the union for their approval. This has now been approved by the union. They're agreeing to this, and 
if we don't approve this, then we're back at the bargaining table. Right. And if we go back and say, nope, no increase, that's it, we might as well take this whole thing out. So that's, that's the issue. What we're also trying to do is we're trying to make the leave benefits the same across the board, not only for our unions, but for our um, non-union employees. So everybody gets the same. So we're going to have to work at this. We're going to have to say give and take. There may be things that we give. There may be other things that we take away. But in the end, we as the council are going to be approving that aspect of it. So this isn't the end all last stop. And no, I don't think that they're expecting um, any increases, I think they're expecting us to look it over and then come back with them. And then it'll be a whole nother discussion and a whole nother um, negotiating. This I just, oh, I, I apologize. Uh, my other concern would be in effort to use that same language so that there is clarity. We already, you already have um, approved the police officer's language with this exact It's language. exact language. And I, I realize that I didn't I didn't look at the red line version because when we <coughs> met with Mr. Brony and Mr. Grimm, I didn't I was told that we just weren't going to be discussing this and that it was going to be discussed later. So I didn't I didn't look at the red line version. This isn't a substantive change. This is just taking out language that is creating a, a, a expectation. So going back to the table, I don't think is a valid reason not to do this. It's not a substantive change to anything. It's just saying we're going to discuss it. And that's what I think this says. I don't. I, okay. I, when you say you have a goal of updated leave benefits, that implies you're going to increase leave benefits. Not to me. It does not to me either. I've seen enough of these happen that it's, that's what it means. Mm -hmm. As Mr. Grimm mentioned, there may be trade-offs on this. So. They could go up in vacation and go down in holidays or to pick it PTO bucket. PTO so bucket. Could be, we have vacation. two buckets right now, sick and, and vacation. It could be one bucket where mm -hmm. everything comes out of one group. It, those are all on the table. We told them that. So there's, there, I don't think they're expecting anything other than a chance to discuss it with us. Then and, let's just say that. Well, I did. I think that's what this says. And, and they, they understand it. And, you know, they've been really good partners to, to work with, even though the labor management sometimes could be adversarial. It's never really been adversarial here. So we've had a good relationship. I really don't feel like jacking them around, so to speak, for just some wordsmithing things. I think they understand the intent. I don't think you can, I personally can't read into updated as a positive increase for them and a negative for us as the city or the employer. I mean, we've even talked about, you know, there's a half day for New Year's Eve and a half day for Christmas Eve day. You know, it might be you get one day versus two half days. That might be an update. And it's not an increase. It's just a change. Um, we've talked about, you know, different leave options um, kind of just, off, you know, that are out there. And we'll have to look at those to see do we want to exchange them for something else. I mean, we talked about berev bereavement leave and how does that factor in here and do you take you know so there's there's a lot of different things that that can come out of this uh, I don't necessarily I mean will it go up it may but but if it goes up mayor and council it's because that's what's going to keep us competitive because that's that's what these guys are asking for there's a lot of young employees here I'm the old dog there's a lot of young employees here that are raising families they would like to spend time off hours with those people and, and they see that it, it could be easier for them to leave here and go somewhere with better leave benefits. Now that's generally not the case, but that's what we're hearing. We're hearing that this is important to them, more so than dollar amounts. I mean, I've, there's two or three leave benefit related things in every contract that we talked about. We nixed most of them with the language that you see there by saying we're committed to looking at it, we're committed to figuring out this calendar year we're committed to putting it in so it's available for everybody, not just union employees starting January 1 of next year. That's clean for us. That's clean for them. They're taking a leap of faith basically by taking their request for changes and leave benefits that they would like to see off the table so we could actually take a good look at this. So, I mean, I appreciate their cooperation on this. They, 
because if nothing happens, they're going to feel like they got the short end of the stick if they've got to live with different lead benefits. And, lead benefits and I do think that years. cooperation is really key to, like you said, it may not be substantive, um, but it has been our past practice, and we've actually been doing this over the last couple of weeks. Um, any sort of language changes against what they approve does go back to the union, and so it is part of what takes time. Um, it may not be a negotiation per se, but then from a language standpoint, we may end up in a negotiation situation where they're saying, you know, why is this being changed and, and are we in agreement with it? But it would go back to the union. That has been. And then so we would take the chance that they wouldn't agree to it, and then we'd basically start over because then they might say, oh, well, if we don't know what's going to happen, then we want this, this, and this. Well, then you just made my point for me. <laughs> they are they are anticipating. They do have expectations tied to this. And if I have a question, <coughs> Does the leave benefits that are negotiated with the unions do they affect the salaries of management? Also, on city at city staff. I'm not sure what you're asking. Yeah, the sure. the leave benefits that are negotiated with the union do those trans do those benefits, um, and, and the reason I ask is when I worked at at and I wasn't part of the union, but when the union passed um, wage increases and leave benefits, I benefited. I was management, but I also benefited. Every time those rates went up, my salary went up, my benefits went up. And my question is, does that happen at the city? Well, I think right now our leave benefits are probably slightly different for the bargaining units versus general employees. And just because the folks in the unions may have negotiated over previous years changes to their leave benefits, that didn't directly translate or impact the rest of city employees. We have, I can't recall we've ever made a change no, to. I think we're still off of the employee handbook yeah, but, which from 07, I think. So yeah, so, so any changes that have happened in the last 11 years hasn't so gone to the non-union employees. There's been no increase in the vacation accrual or sick leave accrual or holidays. Carry the only thing, the only thing I think we changed since I've been here is that we used to have a floating holiday <coughs> and not have the day after mm -hmm. Thanksgiving off, right. and we traded that off. Mm -hmm. We said, we'll give up our floating holiday and just assign it to the day after Thanksgiving. And that was a year after studying it. We purposely, I mean, the council said, We'd like to do it, but how much business are you get? And we said, yeah. we don't know. So we'll track it. So we tracked it for the year. I think we had three employees or three people show up at the door. The one was the guy delivering the newspapers. He pulled on the door and said, he couldn't believe it was open. He said, you guys aren't closed? So nobody comes and they got a few phone calls. I mean, nobody was conducting business on Friday. They just assumed we were closed, so we swapped it out. But I think that's the only been the mm -hmm. substantive change we've done since I've been here. So we have not benefited at all from changes in, in, in and, the bargaining and unit lead benefits, whatever. And it was just a question. I wasn't no, it's like that you did. It was yeah, just no, a but, question. No. But you were, you were saying like there was like a trickle down that everybody kind of benefits from, it, and that's just not the case. And I'm, I'm not going to beat this to death. I have one vote on the council. I'm uncomfortable with this language. And I'll I understand that. that. I appreciate okay. that. All right. Any other questions? Or Ms. I, I do have Haber? one question. Okay. <coughs> so, in, in this paragraph here. Uh, so obviously we're going to revisit this at mm -hmm. some point this year. Um, from a legal perspective, what, let's say we as a council come up with plan, whatever our plan yeah, is. Yes, plan X. Um, and the union says, this particular union, or one of the other two says, we don't like it. Mm -hmm. What are, what, does that nullify the whole contract or what, where does that put us? You know, I think they would just, my guess, and I don't know if Ron wants to jump in since you said a legal question, I don't think it jeopardizes the whole contract. But basically what we've agreed to is to look at it and come back and talk about a negotiation. But it could jeopardize the whole contract. I mean, technically. Oh, well, that's why I asked the question. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't have the contract in front of me. Okay. Yeah. Well, does it negate all of their pay increases? No. no, it'd be okay. no different than I think our, our insurance. We have Re to have a reopener every year because of that we're a small group now or whatever. So oh, it's sort of okay. that. 
So I guess piece, that would be my clear sorry. It probably my would just stay this. Ron is it stated as a reopener as we do with our. So just so this, it's a limited issue. Correct. Right. Yeah. And so it's yeah. stated like Brian was so saying. It would stay the same this. until something new was agreed upon. So I guess if that. Okay. So this this section. Would just that would not affect the rest of the contract. Right. Okay. Because we we said that to them that it's when we do benefit reopeners, it's listed as such, and then this is going to have the same thing. So. Everybody's kind of quote stuck with the fleet benefits that they have this year, and we're going to take a look at them and hopefully adjust it not only for them but maybe other employees, city employees, based on um, the timelines given. Which is why the we want to have it ready by quarter one, which is January, which was our way of saying January. Right. So. Okay. So, Ms. Browner, our goal is to kind of have this before the council and then go into negotiations still this calendar year right. Right. for next year, though. Mm -hmm. Right. The lead benefits page. stay the same this year. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. And then in this contract as well um, is as it will be going forward because of the, the changes with health benefits, we do have that reopener right. every year as well. Every so year. Just, okay. just as another reopener for people to keep in mind as we're moving forward. Okay. So. All right. Okay. Anything else? That's it. Okay, any other questions? Otherwise, is there a motion to approve the local 49 Public Works Labor Agreement with IUOE 49? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, any further questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Three ayes and Bruce nay. Okay, so next is um, acceptance of the paving coring forensics report for 2018 through 2020. This is a uh, part of our preliminary uh, capital improvement plan for our roadways, Mr. Hornby. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Um, as directed by the council, the uh, WSB has prepared a pavement management coring report. The field work was completed, the report's been completed, and um, we did have some items that I've identified <laughs> in our memorandum that somewhat turned our draft CIP upside down. Um, so for instance, hard, hard scrabble, in, that, in 2016, hard scrabble was identified as a reclaimed project. We went through and did the pavement management plan. All well, these pavement management experts are looking at just the surface and making some judgments based on number of cracking and those kind of things. Some of the things that they don't typically see might be in a seal coating effort. They may not see some of the cracking that comes through or see some of the patching that was done. And Public Works does let me know that they end up spending a lot of time and effort, especially in hard scrabble as well as some other cities, or streets, that um, uh, they patch quite heavily. Uh, but hard scrabble then was identified as a mill and overlay, but after coring it, we find that it's a better candidate for reclamation. Um, Loring Drive, same thing. Um, Burl Oaks Drive actually turns out to be a good candidate for a mill and overlay. And Sunnyfield Road, Sunnyfield Road is interesting in that it um, has a lot of heavy traffic from the schools and it is showing signs of rutting, mainly um, uh, due to the heavy vehicles, the bus, buses and the bus traffic that's on them. And um, it's showing some signs of rutting. They did give a recommendation for mill and overlay it's kind of a modified mill and overlay where you would mill off an inch and a half but put a three inch overlay back on. And to do that, you're building up the strength of the pavement section. Um, the other alternative for, the, for Sunnyfield would be to, um, to do a reclamation project with a stabilized subgrade uh, where you put a stabilizing agent down on the road subgrade, shape and compact the roadway, and then put a new surface on top of it. I did price out both uh, the, in the, I did provide another draft um, CIP, more or less trying to see how we could make 2018 work and maybe 2019 and still be around the budget that was set uh, by the council. And uh, so the cost did go up for a mill and overlay. Uh, the costs are similar to a reclaim. I just, uh, from the original CIP that presented had the reclaim numbers, I left that in. Um, on the, the draft that's in your 
that is in your um, packet today. It's not intended that you approve that today. I just want to get comments to see if we have to make any kind of adjustments on it. Um, I'm sorry, um, Mr. Hornby, do you mean that Sunnyfield Road, according to the chart on page 102, that whether you do um, monitor, monitor, and mill and overlay, that the cost is the same as if you did a reclamation on all three of those segments? Sorry, so the monitor would be, in this case, um, we are treating those that are monitored under a, um, as a reclaim rather than a reconstruct. In monitor, you're saying, is that a reclamation? Yes. Okay, so the line item, re a monitor means reclamation, the next one reclamation, and the next one mill and overlay. Yeah, there's a short segment that um, uh, would fall under the mill and overlay, and so we still have that in there as a mill and overlay. And that section, is that the one right next to County Road 110? Correct. Okay. So you're saying whether it's a mill and overlay Okay, so you're saying this is a reclamation. Okay, all right. I would say the way I have it in the um, the prices of the cost, this may cost under what was option two. Option two, if you recall from the CIP, the original draft CIP we put together was looking at these monitored roadways as reclamation projects instead of reconstructs. Okay. So, that's how, so I've carried that through to this second draft. Um, the cost between, if you look to the right, there's just a column to the right of those estimated costs. These are just my notes so I could help keep it straight as well. The cost between the modified mill and overlay and reclamation project are pretty similar. Um, so, I, so I just left the reclaim estimated cost in there for the budget. Um, it really could be either. Um, so I, I, just, I left it in there on that one for the, mm -hmm. just for <coughs> At least a draft discussion. Uh, Paul, a question on that as well. So, with a mill and overlay, obviously they come by with a big machine and they grind off the inch and a half. The problem here is we have ruts from the buses. Mm -hmm. To me, if I think about that, if you come through with a machine, you're going to grind off the, the top of the rut, if you will, and the bottom doesn't get touched. Is that how that would work? In, in this particular case, in the in the forensics report, they're saying that the bond between the layers are actually pretty good. And so uh, you'd want to mill, and mill out enough to get that top layer off completely. But how could you do that because the road, normally you get, the road has to be like this here and you can shave the top off. But if the road's like this and you come through and you shave, you're going to shave the crowns off and the ruts are going to remain. And so if you have a crown in the road, but I shouldn't, crown is not the right word. But you're saying in the right. That's a good question. Right. That is a good question. What's likely going to happen is that that portion may have to go a little deeper in that section to get that run out of there. But how can they? Isn't the machine winded up like the No. Oh, it's no, not. no, no. It's a more narrow machine. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I thought it was and like eight foot wide or something. I should have brought a photo of one together. I was actually just looking at one today on another pavement application, but right now I wouldn't recommend for the city. But um, So it's like two or three feet wide or something? Correct. <laughs> I thought it was like eight feet. Um, Paul. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Paul, here's a couple comments. Sunnyfield is, I believe, on our MSA road, and it is an MSA road. So I'm thinking if we were to you maybe not this year, because I don't know where we're at with our MSA dollars again, but by next year, we should have enough MSA dollars in our bank to do Sunnyfield, to do this. It's a total of 265000 So. $103. Um, if we waited till 2019 to do the Sunnyfield Road, we could use, whether it's reclamation or mill and overlay, whichever, we could use those, we could use MSA dollars. We wouldn't be levying for those dollars. It may put other projects off a little bit, but when we're trying to budget and we're trying to do as much as we possibly can with what limited resources we have, I think this would be a wonderful opportunity to use some S MSA dollars. Having said that, that would also give us another year to determine how we're going to, if we are, going to assess that project. Because if we have to do this and it's for the school, we want to be good stewards with them and partner with them. But on the other hand, our residents shouldn't be picking up the tab 
fully because of this. So then we, we also should be talking about assessment and how that would work and who would be assessed and how much. So to me, that would be a whole other project, which would then take the 265000 and put that into, um, I don't know if it would be hard scrabble if we could do that or not, but um, uh, anyway, that's Madam just Mayor, thought. If I, if yeah. I can add to that comment, um, I, I think the comment about the assess assessment is spot on. Uh, there's a really good example in our neighboring community, Orno. Uh, they are working on rebuilding Crystal Bay Road, which serves the Orno School campus. And it's obviously, it's a lot more extensive than what we're talking about here. But they are asking, the city of Orno is asking the school district to pick up some of the cost for right. that. Yeah, and, and so we should too. I think we should yeah. as well. I mean, yeah. as, as you said, so I think that's fair. If we do that, we would have to give them enough notice to plan and budget for next year. Then, if that's what we'd like to shift it back to, right? Yeah. Right. And, and yeah. well, and they wouldn't be assessed. So, if we did the project in 2019, they really wouldn't be assessed until 2020, or they they wouldn't have to pay for that assessment until 2020, probably. Correct. Yeah. So. But yes, we should give them ample notice saying that we're looking at doing this project and we're looking at some type of an assessment. So, yeah. so having said that, um, if we look at 2019, there's Burl Oaks Court, Burl Oaks Drive, Eagle Nest Drive, Hardscrabble, Hardscrabble, and all the various segments of Hardscrabble. Is there something in there, and I'm, I'm using hard scrabble because it looks like it's one of the bigger ticket items, would, would then the 265,000 cover hard scrabble and we do hard scrabble this year? But I think for, for the report, if I was reading this correctly, and the um, mill and overlay might not be, it's probably not a good enough treatment anymore for hard scrabble, am I correct? Well, and that's what I was gonna this ask. Is, this Paul. is an assessment project. So what I did is this was the, this was the initial, um, draft CIP and I just moved all the columns and lines around to the right you can see my notes as far as what they what the ac actual treatment would be so for instance for hard scrabble that would all be recl reclamation it would so what it, do you have the cost in terms of what that would be I mean do uh, we have to be a lot more than that I mean, I'd have to go back and look but I think these costs reflect the reclamation I, but I have to go back and look at what I have in my oh. Okay. I'd like to make one comment here. Sure. <clears throat> I'd like to step back just a minute. Um, going back to the original topic, which was the core. End. If we go back and think about why do we do the core, end, <clears throat> the reason why we did that, okay, if we look at our roads in general, we have this one group that we, and this is nothing new, we have this one group that's been, a, you know, needs maintenance uh, reclamation to really bad shape. We have the other group of roads that are fairly new and fairly good shape. We had this center group, which I'm going to call, that could be possibly reclaim candidates or mill and overlay. And that was that group that we focused this coring project on. Mm -hmm. okay. And what we want to do is say, and as expected, out of the report, we get some that went to the good side and some that went to the bad side. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. I want to make the point here is that now that we know that, I think we need to step back and say, okay, now we've got that figured out. That doesn't by default mean that if they moved to the bad category, for lack of a better word, that we have to address them right now. I think that puts them into the whole group of all the bad guys, if you will. Okay, so you're saying the middle category is what that, we should focus on. Well, no, let me finish. Okay. What I'm saying is that now we know, we know what the state is. Mm -hmm. Now, if we move them, like in this case, hard scrabble, we move them from a possible reclaim to no, we got to, or from a possible mill and overlay to yet yeah, we got to reclaim them. I think we need to put them in the whole bucket of all the other roads that need to re be reclaimed, and then prioritize them. I don't think that they automatically jump to the top of the list of being reclaimed. Oh, I see. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. And I think mm -hmm. also on the flip side, to okay, we've kind of split this middle section out from our 2018 projects. Um, we may want to look at those that were on the bottom edge of the good ones to say, do we need to do mill and overlays on those now so they don't fall into mm -hmm. the reclaimed category? And so I think 
that's where I really want to step back on this and go, it, just because you just fell, out, fell into the bad category doesn't mean we get on you this right away. I think we go, okay, that's good to know, but we need to put them in that whole bucket. And likewise, on the other side, to say, okay, we, we drew the line here, but if the PCI was, or the, the index was, I'm just making the number up here, if it was 80, maybe we need to look at those and say, better mill and overlay those now and catch them before they fall into this bucket. And that's kind sure. of where I'm looking mm -hmm. at this overall. Okay. So I don't know if I want to just jump right in and say, yep, we're going to do hard scrabble this year. And, and also, yeah. I think... The reason I was looking at it was just because it's, like, on the list. I know, so, I know. Yeah. That's, but that's, I, I, I understand what you're saying. The hard, yep. That's the fallacy I want to get yeah. away from. Is yeah. Just because it's on the list, this is a small part of a very big list. Sure. Um, the other thing I think we need, uh, we've alluded to here, is the assessment policy that uh, I think what I've seen in the past is we as couple, make a couple of assumptions. Number one, it has to be a big project, whatever that is, to be assessed. I don't think we need, that should really be our policy. I think if it's reclaimed, it's assessed. It's, you know, that's okay. fair. Reclamation, we have been doing <coughs> assessments. Okay. Yeah. So I just want to make sure we yeah. keep that policy sure. to be fair and also to help mm -hmm. our budget. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think... <coughs> well then, let me ask maybe Paul, if, okay, so, well, actually the council, does it make sense to maybe move Sunnyfield to 2019 using MSA dollars? Yes. In my I opinion. think so. Okay. Yeah, it sounds All right. That then frees up 265000 so then we should ask Paul which ones, to your point, which ones should we do mill and overlay on, right? Right, I mean, right. I mean, should we be taking some things and moving them up? rather than going after reclaim. So going through the forensic report, the only one you would do that to would be Berlin, uh, Berlo. No, I'm not, I'm not talking about the ones that were forensic. I'm talking about beyond that range. Because we only did the forensics on those that we thought were questionable. First, the first three that were on the mill and overlay list, yes. Yeah, so we, we but there's some, if you ranked the roads by the, the uh -huh. um, index, which I think the original report did, there were some that were real close to not being in this group of core. But you didn't purpose. core them is what you're saying. So we wouldn't necessarily correct. know. So we'd be right in the same back same boat yeah. here a month and a half from now. Okay. Well I think I think that the okay. assumption was that we thought they were good enough that they wouldn't need to be cored. I mean if, if we've got more out there that we think are mill and mill and overlay and we already think that they may not be, we've got a bigger problem than what we thought. So when we looked at the plan overall, we were looking at what would fall in that mill and overlay category. What didn't we want to fall back into a monitor or reclaim category? And that was anything above 50. So we looked at anything that was above 50 and then try to put that into the budgets that we broke down um, with the CIP budget. So you went above 50, but how far above 50 did you go? In the range was 50 to 80, 50 to 85. <coughs> well, so and there, are, and there are some roadways. I should state this. And working with Public Works, they wanted on a couple of roadways. They only had a couple of areas that could use a little patching around manhole structures and maybe a, a one bad area or something they could patch, like and Eagle's Nest. They could bring right, and they could bring that 80 up to an 89, and they wanted to seal coat it. Okay, well that's it's using city forces to do that work, maintenance work, and they have better capabilities today than they had did two years ago in their patching. That's something they wanted to try. So some of those we did also note in this plan and the previous plan that they wanted to try to get, get the rating up so it could just have a seal code application, get another five years out of it, and then reevaluate it for potential mill overlay. Well, the other thing we could do is we could do the Burl Oaks Court and Burl Oaks Drive since those have been cored and we know that they will, we could do the mill and overlay. The Eagle's Nest we don't need to do the mill and overlay there. That's just a short distance. That's the one you're talking about that um, our public works could do. And then if we don't do anything in any other mill and overlay projects this year, we just set that money aside for next year. And Because I don't want to hold this up. Mm -hmm. And it, to me, it doesn't seem to make sense to spend levy dollars on MSA roads when we can use MSA funds. So. But we could do a lot of other reclamation mm -hmm. projects this year with those dollars. But we haven't poured them. That's the problem. Well, if, we do, if we're going to do a reclamation, we already know we're going to 
you don't really need to record them because it's not we're going to tear up all the asphalt anyhow. I don't. I don't think we have enough dollars in the budget to do any reclamation unless there's. Well, if I mean, we assess. And so if you so you'd have to go through a 429 process on the assessments, which you have done in the past. That's one thing on a timeline to look at. Um, but I think what Councilmember Monitor uh, Molitor is saying is that um, those that are identified as monitor or reconstruct under option two were identified as a reclaim option. So you can look at those right identified in the column to the left of the estimated cost. You can look at those as being, it says reconstruction or monitor. Those would be the ones that would fall into a reclaim. Under which, plan. okay, which page are you on in our packet? I'm Do just you know? looking, for instance, looking at page, well, I don't want to use page three because we found that. Uh, um, in our packet, in our it might be different. Upper Cove. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at that will be the CIP, uh, excuse me, here, 104. Oh, okay. Page 104. So see at the top, Upper Cove Road. Yeah, Cove yeah, Lane. okay. That's 104. Construction and monitor. Mm -hmm. uh, to the right of the estimated cost, I put in there that this could be a reclaim option. That's what's priced out there is to reclaim that whole area rather than go through and reconstruct. Because those, um, those roadways that in the initial CIP, they were identified as overlay or known overlay in the left column, after coring were determined to be reclaim projects or reconstructs. So basically, at Jennings we did core those Upper Cove yeah. Road. Okay, yeah. we cored those. Okay. Yeah. Jennings Cove area, uh, basically those roads are shot. Shot. Okay, but you're saying we? I, th I thought initially you said we can't do a reclamation project on those because of the curb and gutter, but now you're saying we can. It's a remove payment option. Is what it's, it's a little different. But okay. So the, the price to reclaim it versus removing the pavement is about the same. Okay. The contractor's going to come in and either use a milling machine or a reclaim machine. They're going to pick up the material and they're going to haul it out. Okay. Or, you know, if they're more old school, they might just come in and chunk it out with a loader and haul it out. You're basically removing the, removing the pavement, you're scarifying, recompacting the aggregate base, and then you put a new pavement on top. If there's crack, broke curb, you know, we look at replacing that along the line. Okay, so do we, I, I would have to add all these numbers then. You're saying, Upper Cove, East Cove, Cove Circle, West Cove, Jennings Cove, Jennings Cove, West Cove, West Cove. You're saying all of those we could do? Again, I'd have to add the numbers, but they well, seem to be more than 265. You're going to exceed the $350,000 budget, I think, in the 2018. And then that brings up a policy question. Are you going to treat that like a reclaim and assess for that work? Or are you going to? Well, that's what I would think. Because no, it's still no. a different application we've done before. Right. Cost-wise, they turn out to be about the same as a reclaim. It's effectively, you're just using different equipment. Mm -hmm. It's effectively, you're doing the same thing. You're removing the asphalt, yes. just like what we did in Grandview, just like we did in Tuxedo. You just, you don't use the same machine, but effectively, it's all the same. Mm -hmm. so I don't know why we would not assess. I just don't understand why they would do that. And then if we did Well, that, even if you assess, you still need the funds up front, you know, to pay for the project. Right. So then, then you're talking about a loan of some kind, and I thought we were trying to avoid that. Yeah, I think we did all of that Jennings Cove area. We're going to be over four and a quarter, four hundred twenty thousand. Okay. So then, not, back. Not necessarily. That's not true. Well, you can take that from reserves. Well, oh, I don't think you'd want to do no. that. I mean, I mean that I, would I, be a Brian question. Why it has to be bonded. I don't get that. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, we it wouldn't have to be, but we'd have to identify a source for it, or, or whether to transfer from somewhere, or, or borrow ahead from future levy, or I don't know what you're. I mean, there's different ways. I guess you could do it. I, I, I guess. I, I mean, you're my, gonna, it's going to get paid back by the residents over the course of the time of the assessment. We're basically self-funding that bond. Fifty percent, depending on yeah, right, percentage. If we the, go to the fifty percent, we have to pay third, whatever we end up right. doing. I mean, yeah, we. <laughs> well, essentially, the city. Perhaps the entire cost of it, and over, right. over that yeah. Yeah. 15 or 20 years, you re regain that. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, but I, it's really a cash flow issue. It's not mm -hmm. a, a, a pay this. Well, let's look at, <laughs> I still think we should look at the money that we currently have and see what projects we want to do for 2018, because if we don't approve them 
No, we're well, going to be. looking for an approval tonight. I think we're looking. No, we were no. just accepting the report. Right. right. We're the, accepting the, the forensic yes. report. Yes. Yeah. Right. What I want council to do is be able to give some direction so we can bring a CIP back, at least for 2018. So right. That's that what rolling. I. Because we could address 2019 in the later years. Right. <coughs> throughout the year. But if we don't get going on the 2018 projects, then we're going to be in the same boat that we were last year with doing the projects in the fall, and I don't want to do that. That's why, that's why we do need to be f fairly specific on this tonight. They can well, bring I don't back, think we have a plan for 2018, yeah. to be honest with you. I think, I think too much has changed. I think it would be nice to get um, Gary Peters' opinion, too, as far as what that seeing some okay. of these things have changed. I know it's, it's too bad. I, I think Gary was saying all along that those roads we cored probably were going to be a reclamation versus right. a mill and overlay. So I think the report verified that Gary knows his stuff. <laughs> right. So I think... Um, <coughs> But that's I think we shouldn't be in a rush to just jump in and hey we got three hundred fifty thousand dollars we just got to spend it on on something or no. whatever I think we need to get a game plan no right in and but what I'm saying and if dollars carry over to next year I think right. that's an okay idea too I mean we you know it's it's not the end of the world if we don't mm -hmm. spend it all this year I think so. right that's what I'm saying is if we don't spend it all this year we carry it over till next year so I mean we could even do the 2018 um, what's presented here except not Sunnyfield and carry over two hundred sixty five to next year. We got a lot of other roads that aren't even on this list. Yeah. I, okay. I, I just don't know why we wouldn't throw those back in the mix then. Okay. So, just, so if these were, were, this was just to get you a five year CIP. And yes, there are some other ones. For instance, Loring Drive got pushed at 2023 plus. Okay. So that's basically, it's, it's still in here as 2023, but that's outside your five year CIP, along with a number of other ones. Trails End, I believe, is out there. Mm -hmm. We just we pushed them out farther. Yeah. You know, if, but the, the goal here was to establish five-year CIP um, it's evaluated every year right and um, you know even on those roads if you look at trails end initially in the pavement management plan was identified as a mill and overlay but once you court it now it's a reclaim right so we're seeing it we're seeing a pattern on those if you if you wanted to get a project going I guess what I would suggest doing is look at doing something like Burl Oaks and that small section of Eagle Nest and then move that Eagle Nest up into the seal coat for mm -hmm. 2018 and do those and push the rest of those funds out and, and then look at the seal coat that we have identified um, in 2018 and get those completed and whatever funds you have left over, push those to 19 and have a big larger project so you could get at Hard Scrabble or Sunnyfield. You know, and those assessed projects, <coughs> Every time we've done them, they drag out. Yeah, and they don't go on and the first try looking, usually. We're into like, April yeah. already. Yeah. By the mm -hmm. time we even decide what we're going to do, it's going to be May, June, whatever. So, I mean, and I don't want, like Lisa stated, mm -hmm. to go back into October, November. Mm. Oh, I, I won't give you any argument there. Yeah. The only thing I could see is if I'm looking at this list here, we have mm -hmm. a couple of mill and overlays. Now, I don't think that they were cord, but... To Shane Lane, Mill and Overlay in 2021. If you added those numbers together, it would be less than the 265. So if you wanted to do to Shane Lane, or at least give staff maybe a nod saying, okay, maybe we want to look at that. I don't know. Um, Those were outside of the coring limits. So the right, I know, that's what I'm saying. There's, and there's always risk when you do that. And, yeah. Um, even seeing that there is one in, and there is a monitor, it's just below a rating of 50. But um. Well, then the question is, maybe we just go with um, the preventative for sure, and then staff can come back at our next meeting and say which mill and overlay. Pro and it looks here, Burl Oaks, we can do those because those were cord. And move the eagle's nest into the um, seal coat or chip or whatever that is. So don't do the mill and overlay. That's just a small little section. There was just a small section that was um, that had an issue, um, and Public Works would like to see that area milled and then patched. Was it, what happened in there is the curve oh they do is, want it milled. The curve is higher than the pavement in that short segment. Okay, that's why it's in there as a mill and overlay. All right, that could those three projects segments could get moved to 2018 and then we had identified eagle's nest as a seal coat for 2019 that could get bumped up to 2018 let's just do that small section on the seal coat 
Mm -hmm. um, or we or we look at uh, leaving it where it is and seal coat it next year, and that's in that Turtle Creek area, and it's all being seal coated. We tried to also look at because we heard council talk about let's try to concentrate some of these streets and neighborhoods. Right. right. So we tried to fit that into this as well. So you, know, you could fit parts of Jennings Cove into. Yeah. No, I don't think not, you want to do, do that. Yeah. No. Well, then, does does that make sense doing the uh, Burl Oaks, Burl Oaks, Eagle's Nest, and then the other um, chip seal, chip seal, and whatever maintenance on the others, and then we'll work, and then any money we carry over until 2019, and then in 20, then we start working on 2019 now. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's a good idea because we still got to remember we're still finishing up Halstead and Enchanted mm -hmm. too. So you don't yeah. maybe want to try yeah. to put too much in right. one season. Or I think I think it's it's it make, makes sense. So no, I think that's, that's what I recommend doing is move okay. those. What's the number then? Well, I have to go back and pull that up. So. Well, look at the difference between. Let's see. It's twenty three two seventy forty three thirty three nineteen thousand. 19 would be taken off, though, because you think public works will be able to do that? No, 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 no okay. that would be okay. included as part of the mill and oh, okay. project. So we would have 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, so roughly 80, 83, 85,000, a little less, minus, you're the accountant, minus 265. So we'd still have um, 60, 70, 80, 80,000 left that would carry over into 2019. I'm just doing rough math here, people. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> does that? It doesn't work. Does really, but, oh, I, I can't support that. We've okay, got what, so what many, would you want? Then? Well, we've Tell got so many bad roads in the city, and we're just saying, well, let's just carry them over to next year. It's like it doesn't get done. So are, are, are you suggesting that we just come back at a work session next week and perhaps evaluate everything together? It, I, the whole point of this was, well, there's a couple of points, but one of them was to have a, a plan, and now we're just kind of, uh, a couple out of here, a couple out of here, a couple out of here, and oh, we'll take this and shove it here, but it doesn't sound like a plan to me. It just sounds like a haphazard doing it at 8.30 because we want to get done. I, I don't like that. That's not true. Mm -hmm. No, what we're... I'll stay in mm -hmm. past 8.30. Well, I don't care, whatever time. <laughs> it just doesn't, to me, it doesn't mm -hmm. sound like it's... So, no, I, I agree uh, to point on that. I would like to see us use our 350000 this year. So, because that's what the budget was, and you know whether we move some of these other projects up. So here's here's our dilemma. We've only done coring on a certain number of streets, so we only know for sure which streets we can do mill and overlay projects on. So <coughs> hold on just a second. So all I was doing is I was looking at the proposal, the um, proposed CIP, and I'm going down the list. I'm not picking willy nilly. I'm going down the list. I'm saying, okay, if we do. Um, everything in 2018, less Sunnyfield, and then you continue down into 2019, and you do the first one, two, three, three in 2019, okay? So I'm not just picking. Those have already been cored, so we already know that. That gets us within 85,000 of, of our budget. So if you want, we could then say to staff, do some more forensic coring to see what else we can add which will delay, and I don't want to delay everything. You know what I'm saying? I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm trying to also make sure that we move this along, too. Because yeah. I don't well, think it's bad to leave a little money in the fund, because right now we've got like 5000 We've spent everything in the fund. We've got like $5,000 sitting there, so it's not right. like we're sitting on money we can add and supplement you know, projects and stuff. We've spent what we've had, so to actually have a little carryover to give you a little, maybe something to do in future years isn't the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Can we talk you into that, Mike? <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> would it make sense to do some of the maintenance that we have scheduled for 19 and 18? The Preventative? Yeah. Add some more of those? Yeah. Let's mm -hmm. ask staff then. Does that make sense or is that, I mean, that's is that, does, that, does that not work with the patching they want to do? Well, we'll make the adjustments. They haven't started patching yet. No, I mean, will they be able to patch and then still get the seal coat on this year? Uh, it's well, a that, would be, that would be the goal. The, um, right. In the past, we've done a cooperative project with Victoria and Shorewood on our uh, chip sealing, our seal coating. And um, they're looking at approving that this month. And 
we were trying to, you know, we can we can move some more roads into uh, 2018 from 2019. You're saying preventative roads, right? For the okay. We may have a little bit of overlap as far as how long it had been. I, what I don't want to do is start chip sealing roads that we just did three right. years ago. Right, of course. I think that's what Mike is saying too. Yeah, we don't want to pre pre treat them, but if right. Okay, so if you do that, can you come back then next meeting saying, okay, you can look at the ones, we don't want to pre-treat them or you know, treat them prematurely, but can you come back and say, here's our plan. Um, we're going to do Burl Oaks, Burl Oaks Drive, uh, Eagle Nest, not do Sunnyfield, do all of the uh, preventative ones up here in 2018 and then these are the ones from 2019 that we can add. If they don't quite come up to 85 or 80,000, I agree with Brian, I think to have a little extra in there is just fine. We'll use it um, the following year then. Yep, certainly can do that. Yeah, I'd like yeah, Gary's opinion just to make sure we're not doing something just for the sake of doing it. You know, Correct, yeah. and that you can work that out and bring that back. Uh, Gary's had this list and he hasn't okay. given me any feedback. Okay. Does that make sense? So what are we actually approving here? Kind of what, we, what I just said. Bring back this list, so not do Sunnyfield this year. Move it into 2019 with MSA dollars. Um, do all of the, um, the Chip Seal uh, city streets that are listed for 2018. Then move down into 2020 and do Burl Oaks overlay, Millen overlay, Burl Oaks Drive, Eagle Nest Drive, those are the three mill and overlays that we've already cored that we know. And then going down into the chip seal for 20, sorry, 19, 19. 2019, thank you, um, and see what we, should, what we could do there in 2018, moving that up a little bit without doing it too prematurely. Right. And the idea there is to set your 2018 CIP streets and treatments, uh, and we can come back and work on 19 through 2023. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, are we, does that make sense? That makes sense to me. I'd like to get as close to 350 because that's what we voted on and the votes were a big priority. Uh, survey and all of that kind of indicates that. So I'd like to go as close to that as we can. Okay. And, and it makes sense to me. I, I just don't want to do anything prematurely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I think we sure agree that. Right. We're not doing that. Yeah. Mike, are you on board with that? Okay. What about the reclamation roads and our discussion on how we're going to tackle those? That'll come back to the council. That they'll be 2019 or 2020, whenever. But that'll have to well, be. Obviously, we don't want to wait till that long because no, we, we don't. They won't happen in 2018. Right. That's we won't do any reclamation in 2018. <clears throat> we will have to decide how we're going to tackle those in 2018 for 19 or 20. Right. I mean, for years to come. You know, next right. couple and years. Look at getting the start on design and public informational meetings, yes. and I'll go down that route after, I would say, no later than July, starting right. July of this year to do that. Mm -hmm. That's what's, I mean, those are the kinds of things that can set you back. I mean, on Halstead, if you remember, we got bumped and bumped because we had, um, we, we had to go back and revisit that, had some additional public informational meetings, and then took a portion of that project out. Yeah. So, okay. And then, and then the other thing for the council is we do have a resolution in your packet that would accept the pavement core and forensic report for the 2018-2020 draft capital improvement plan and uh, we'd look to, for the council to accept that we're not approving the capital anything with the capital improvement plan. right so you have but i have direction you have direction to the next meeting pretty clear is that okay mm -hmm. so um so is there then a motion to accept the pavement coring forensic report so moved okay is there a second second Okay, motion has been made by Ms. Mortensen and seconded by Ms. Bruce. Any further questions? All those in favor, signify with aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes 4-0. And we'll see that at our next meeting. Do we want to bring the CIP back to our work session? It might be easier. 
Yeah. Okay, so let's bring that back at the work session, and then if we're going to approve it and we're going to move forward, which I hope we will, um, then we'll bring that back, then we add, we'll add it then to the council agenda. Okay. Um, are we going to have Gary here? <coughs> I think he for sure okay. should be, yeah. yeah. Mike will make sure he's here. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll just decline his vacation. But, but actually, he's on vacation. So he's on vacation yeah. now. So, and I just want to say, this really helps, the way you laid this out. Um, thank you. Yeah. It just, it's just unfortunate that three-quarters of the roads that we court weren't suitable for the... Um, application was identified right so no. maybe but that's why you core that was why we cord all right so we're going to move on to the next item and that is uh, council appointments and designations we don't need to make any major changes except we do need one um, we need a member f to uh, round out our personnel committee meeting our personnel um, committee and we do need to meet this week and I was wondering if um, Pam, would you be willing to serve on that committee, at least on a temporary basis, maybe permanently? Um, I have thought of it, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that would work into my schedule. Okay, because um, we do have some more negotiations coming up, and then once we get the new, um, is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, once we get the new council member on board, which will be at our next meeting, then we can maybe shuffle a couple other things around. So. <laughs> <laughs> With that, all right, so I need a motion to appoint Council Member Mortensen as one of the um, personnel committee members. And is that a temporary appointment? Or? Let's make it permanent, but once John is on board, we can talk about well, Generally, we or. make these appointments for a year, right? Yeah. so this will fill out the rest of this calendar year. Okay. We do this every January, so you can look at it next January. One of the reasons I was thinking the new member wouldn't be good on the personnel committee because of all the union negotiations and all the stuff that we've been talking about for the past year or whatever, um, it might be a little much. So that's why I was thinking maybe Pam or Mike um, would be good to finish off this year maybe. Would that be? And then next January. But there's some, some other things we can talk about too next, next time. Okay. So, is there a motion? Can I make a motion myself? Yes, you can. Okay, then I'll... <laughs> so moved. All right, is there a second then? <coughs> I'll second that. All right, a motion has been made and seconded to appoint um, Councilmember Mortensen to the um, committee. <laughs> Personnel committee. <laughs> it's getting late. All right. Um, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. So now we have staff reports. Mr. Brony? Uh, yes, Mayor and Council. Uh, as you alluded to, we do have a labor negotiation set with our police supervisors on Thursday of this week. So I will be contacting Ms. Mortensen and Mayor uh, Whalen to set up a time that will jive with uh, uh, Cassandra, Brian, and I schedule this week on Tuesday, Wednesday to kind of discuss their most recent request. Um, and so we'll do that sometime Tuesday or Wednesday. So we're okay. scheduling that up. Um, I think that's all I have. Okay. And um, City Clerk? <laughs> Ms. Lindquist? Yep. Just a reminder that on um, Wednesday, April 25th, we will be having the open book meeting here. That is nothing that the council needs to attend. Uh, the Hennepin County Assessor will be here. Um, just letting people know that if they do want to meet with him, it's highly recommended that they make they call his office first to make an appointment. Okay. And that's here at City Hall on the 25th? On April 25th from 4 to 7. Okay. In this room. All right. And, and that's posted on our website? It's posted on the website, it's okay. posted on the board, and it's been published in the paper. Okay. All right. Okay. And uh, Madam Mr. Mayor Abel? Council, I just need a representative, a liaison to attend the April 23rd uh, Planning Commission meeting. I, I can do that. I'll, I, take, I'll actually, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take that. Well, yeah. I haven't been to one. <laughs> I'll tell you what, this will be the last one I do this year. You can have them all after that. The reason, <laughs> the reason why I mention that is because of the topic we talked about last time, 
it's a continuation of the public hearing and it was actually requested that I come back since okay. I had started the first one okay so and all that's right. why I'd like to do that but seriously after that you're gonna have them all well <laughs> can, I'm you looking can, you can at spread the joy but I'll, okay I'll that's good for the rest I'll, of I'll give you that one Mike <laughs> <laughs> all right Mike Thanks. yeah um, all right so I should have said I'll arm wrestle you but I think you'd win so, all, right. <laughs> all right then um, then uh, council reports uh, we'll start with Ms. Bruce. I don't have anything. All right. And Mr. Molitor? Um, I'll start with LMCD. Um, as I mentioned last time, we had a discussion. Well, we, we continued our discussion and came to a conclusion on the um, inspection program. Uh, we decided that we have the grant of $10,000, so we are going to budget to spend that $10,000 grant. If there's an additional grant, we will look at how to uh, use that. But that, what that means is we'll be scaling back the program, but it will exist in some scaled back some, yeah. form. Okay. So, um, planning commission, um, we uh, there's a couple things. Uh, the main one is the VRBO, uh, as mentioned, and we basically uh, we had a lot of discussion about that, uh, various aspects. Uh, we'll continue that as discussed on, at the next meeting. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, we've been has been brought up is the notification of that, um, and I think I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, David. Sure. The, the concern is to be fair for everyone, and but make it practically workable. So. Sure. Yeah, thank, thank you, Council. Um, <coughs> as I brought up at our last staff reports, our last Council meeting, the idea was to get, we've done our standard public notification for this ordinance, but the concern is that um, getting, getting more notice out there, especially to those, I guess the, the original concern was to those who are actually doing the short-term rental. So what I had proposed at our last Council meeting was to just send a notice to those who, are, who we think are doing short-term rental. And, Mr. Mollard and I, and I had a conversation about that, about the, the fairness of that, and is that necessarily fair that we're only notifying one side? And so uh, an idea, a couple different ideas were thrown out there, but one I think um, seems uh, more uh, streamlined from staff and probably the most cost effective would be um, we have a newsletter going out here very shortly. Mm -hmm. And so the idea being we put the, uh, a notice, if you will, mm -hmm. in the newsletter, which will go to all of our residents oh, in, okay. in Minatrista. Mm -hmm. And then um, also then we would still notify those who we think um, are doing the short-term rental. So we're trying to c cover everybody because as we know, some of these people who are doing short-term rental aren't residents, um, so they're not going to get the newsletter. So it's the, in, okay. in a way of not... Um, overburdening with with notices or spending a lot of money on, on notices mm -hmm. but yet getting the message out there mm -hmm. um, letting everyone know that the council is discussing this it'll be con uh, discussed again at the April 23rd Planning Commission meeting um, where um, everyone residents non residents property owners um, okay. have the opportunity to know what, what's going on and then um, do we also pop because it's a um, public hearing it has it or will it again be published in the Laker it will not. We can do that again because um, okay. they, they didn't close it. They continued it is what they is did. Is there a big cost if we were to publish it in the Laker again? There would be a cost. It's not, I mean, it's just the publication cost. It's certainly um, something I mean, we can do if you'd like. Just might be um, good to do so that um, if it's not a huge cost, then that way people know it's still open. Mm -hmm. It's around 30 to $40. Oh, then I, yeah, I think we should do that. And it'll be on a website? Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah, let's, I mean, I think for $30, $40, it's worth it. Okay. okay. If, so okay. if it pleases the council, then we'll, we'll put it in the next newsletter, which will go out the next week or two. Yeah, but it'll hit almost next week. Okay. Okay. Probably late next week at this point. Okay. okay. And we'll, we'll notice about, uh, there's yeah. 12 to 18 properties that we have a list of that we think have either at one time done the short-term rental or are currently advertising for okay. it. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Anything else? I had a question. Now that we have a vacant planning commission seat, um, 
is that going to be on the agenda? Are, are we going to notify people that that's open and well, look for candidates for if that? You, I don't know if you were here when we started the alternate. So we're, we just take an alternate and move them there, into and, we, and if you recall, we did alternate number one and alternate number two. Okay. And alternate number one will automatically be sworn in then now okay. as a regular um, planning commissioner. Mm -hmm. That's why we did the alternate, mm -hmm. so they'd be kind of ready and waiting, so to speak. So are we going to look for another alternate? Well, well it, um, I guess it's, it's a question for the council if you want to actually advertise. I mean, there again, we do it every every year, you right. know, and we're this close into the year. If you want to, um, we'll, we still do have one alternate um, in, in the, the bullpen, so it's a matter of if you want to go through that process. So if you have somebody yeah. planning that bails out yet this year, you could use the second alternate, but yeah. you'd have to have a, probably another council Interview uh, thing. Yeah, and, yeah. interview thing. And then no, I'm, I'm not pull. recommending that we do that. It was just yeah. a question of process. Yeah. yeah, I think we're good until January. And generally, you advertise at the end of the calendar mm -hmm. year for the next year. Because there's always people whose terms are up mm -hmm. don't know if they're going to reapply or not. So. Okay. Yeah. so will staff notify this gentleman that's the first alternate? Mm -hmm. OK. Yep. Yep. And um, he'll be there and get sworn in yep. at the April yep. meeting. OK. Speaking of swearing in, we'll swear to Mr. Schumperlein at our next yep. meeting. Yep, he'll so. be sworn in right before so so come <laughs> point of law do I need a letter of resignation from the planning yes 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 okay. In, to, to me yep. okay. Okay. it's fine good point thank you all Madam right mayor actually um planning commissioner stone's already been sworn in yeah but he was sworn in as an alternate so does that matter he's still a com uh, planning commission member oh okay so he would yeah, just I be. I think he needs to. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know if that made a difference, but okay. All right. Okay. Um, anything else that Miss? You're done. Okay, Miss Martinson. Okay, WCC. The meeting is uh, this week. No, next week, the twelfth. Uh, they have decided to keep the location of the meetings at one location. It was moving every month. They're now going to have it at the Mound Fire Department in the city offices. Um, and this, on the 12th, they are going to be uh, having a speaker from Harrison Bay Senior Living Development in Mound. Um, so that should be very interesting. Uh, Spirit of the Lakes um, is July 20th and the 21st. Um, we are submitting our sponsorship. Um, if we want to participate in the parade, and Paul, I know you guys, the police always participate. Um, and if anybody on the council wants to, I am going to be on vacation. Um, so if you want, they would have to arrange a convertible. And I can hook them up to Turk, uh, who has been very generous to help us out in that. So, so you're saying the parade is the 20? 21st, which is the Saturday. Okay. And the parade is later. It's like 1 o'clock. Yeah, OK. So. I don't know yet if I'm going to be there or not. OK. Uh, Trista Day, I am meeting with Cassandra and Amy on Thursday to kind of wrap up just a few more details. I've collected almost all the prizes. <laughs> um, yeah, and the contests are going to the schools this week, probably tomorrow. For the coloring contest and name the pink team. Mm -hmm. And I am planning to attend the Hennepin County State of the County. Oh, I am on too. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you need to post that or whatever. I think the only request is that you let them know that you're attending. I did RSVP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I so RSVP too, so. so. All right. Okay. Um, I don't have any reports, so <laughs> I was on vacation, so. All right. With that, um, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Motion was made by Ms. Bruce and seconded by Mr. Molitor. All those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes. Thank you.